everything is going to hell down here in Texas. Kids. And here we go. I'll do it since Joe's muted himself. Welcome, everybody, to the show. Hi, Joe. Hi. Well, Alpha 66 beat me to it anyway. Good Lord. I think I screwed it up. It's And here we go. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And up, here everybody? we go. Welcome to the show. This is episode number 284. Of the Lone Gummit Podcast. It is I, the Triple B, your host, and along with me today is the bearded clam from the Northeast, Joe Borelli. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Good evening, everyone. Oh, Catskills Joe. Yes, sir. That's vague. That's pretty vague, right? Yeah, I guess it's vague enough. Yeah. You can get away with that. Yeah. So, how was your week, sir? It was good. Two weeks. Yeah, two weeks. I am on day 13 in the mountains, and uh, it is interesting. I'm doing a lot of reading, a lot of research, a lot of exercising, all that good stuff, you know? Sounds like fun. <laughs> Burning wood, chopping wood. It's snowed, it's rained. The last two days, it's completely rained. So... Well, I know I've missed being live here on YouTube. It's been two weeks. Um, and just a reminder, folks, if you're here and you love us, hit the subscribe button. We're almost to 1,500 subscribers, which would be epic to accomplish before this show is over tonight. Make sure you like this video. Hit that little bell to get notified every time we go live. And, uh, well, without further ado, we're going to be talking about Jack Ruby, his girls, his dancers, his entertainers, his women of the night, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, on this uh, on this show. Uh, there's some interesting things out there about a lot of his uh, entertainers and dancers, and they had a lot of things to say about Jack Ruby and about the assassination itself. Um, and we're going to get into all that, I promise. But before we do, I just wanted to say hi to everybody and a big thank you, especially to John, my buddy. Uh, thank thank you, John. you so much. You are the man. And Greg, uh, man, thank you, sir. I know it's thank been you. a while. Uh, I hung out with Greg when I went to Dallas, Joe, back in 2019. We hooked up and we went to uh, the. You the, hooked up? Well, not in the <laughs> not in the Jack Ruby sense of hooking up, but uh, uh, well, I humped his leg a little bit, if, if, if that counts. Okay, that's that counts, I guess. <laughs> as long uh, as no, you didn't just eat him and stuff. <laughs> no, no, no. I did eat something uh, with Greg. Uh, we we, we uh, I think we might have Ubered our way over to Lee Harvey's. It's a very. <sighs> I'll just say run down cool place to hang out. It's, it is a dive bar for sure. Um, but it has a certain je ne sais quoi, if you will, Joe, a little bit. Yes. And ambiance. Yeah. It's one of the places where you walk into the bathroom and just every corner of it is covered in graffiti and piss and it stinks, but oh. it's awesome. Not ambiance, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> and, well, that and then you, and then you walk out of the bar, and then they have a like a flea market set up where people sell like old albums and leather goods and 
Mm-hmm. It's just a kind of a cool, and hubcaps and and what I don't know what all they sell. Probably meth and you know a little bit of crack. But we had a blast, me and Greg. We uh, <laughs> drank a couple brewskis and ate some uh, ate some chicken, some bar chicken. It was it was damn good though. Um, uh, yeah, we we kind of hung out. We were like the youngest ones that were at Lancer that year, so uh, hmm. we kind of hung out uh, that weekend. I think, and I think Greg can attest to the fact that your boy rode a scooter. And didn't wreck it. I know. Unlike well, you, sir, well, in Dallas. I made this announcement on the Ocelli effect, <laughs> and I will uh, re-announce it, but I have been training on the bird, and I'm going to conquer it. training wheels on your bird scooter? No, there's no training wheels. And in, <laughs> fact, in fact, I'm going to pull tricks. You're going to pull what? Tricks. Oh, yeah. Sure. It's like... Kind of like a pun for the show, in a way, right? You're gonna pop a wheelie. I'm just gonna pull tricks like Ruby's girls, like and uh, yeah, I'm gonna like blow away the whole Lancer <laughs> smoking section, <laughs> which is a pretty happening place to be, might I say so myself. And uh, even though I don't smoke anymore, but it's just like fun to go down there and hang out and get your coffee in the morning. And uh, oh, I'm sure you least- still smoke something, right? Oh, well, the electronic kind. I mean, yeah. thanks. You just... <laughs> uh, That's considered smoking, Joe. I know. I, fi- I figured we're, we're screwed ready for this one. So. Oh, no. This should be a... This should be a home run. No, in this terms of problems. this... In terms of this place. <laughs> yeah, we'll be all right. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's say what's up to everybody. I see uh Tiny Dancer. Hello. I'm dying Good here. <coughs> Whoo. Too much Silk City. No, I mean the spicy meat stick, and I got a piece of spicy, like big time. Woo. It happens. Oh man. It happens. Whoo. Whoo. Great to see you, Tiny Dancer, Office 66, of course. Of course, Claude Williams, South What's up, to West. Mike, Claude. TD. Garden and Guns. Tiny Dancer. The Big Bad Bob, if that is your real name, it is. Uh, don't hate. No. I was given that by a very famous person. <laughs> uh, you know, it just. You remember, like Bob Clark. And Doug Campbell, they actually devoted a show. What was it called? The- you know, when you when you're deemed by one of the greats to be Bob Clark, then that is what I then that is what I shall be. Yeah, and triple B. that is true. Big bad no one- Bob. Yes. Whew. It is. Uh, Sorry, Joe, I'm still on fire here. I wish it was okay. for this, but it's not. Whew. So if you want to feel like me right now, head down in the description and follow the link and uh, enter the code for 20% off of your entire order. You won't regret it, but your butthole might. That is an old ad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, uh, Silk City messaged me on Twitter a couple weeks ago, and uh, I guess they're going to send me what they sent you. So. Oh, nice! Yeah, yeah. Love Jeff and Silk City. They freaking shout out! Thank you. Big shout out! All right, Joe. Guess hey. what I found? What did you find, sir? Because you know, I was sitting there and I was thinking. All right, I'm trying to think of all these dancers. You know, I'm like, okay, there was um, Jada. You know, uh, Tammy True, Little Lynn. You know, I'm trying to go through and figure and remember all these strip. Oh, I shouldn't say that word. All these entertainers' names, right? <laughs> you already said much worse uh, at this point. Like, <laughs> uh, not, not really. Um, I found a list of fifty-five of Ruby's dancer girls, and among the notables on this list that you may have heard of before is Alice from Dallas. 
April Flowers, <laughs> Betty McDonald, who was Nancy Jane Mooney, who was D.A.G.O.'s girlfriend and who ended up hanging herself uh, in prison or in jail, county jail, uh, about two months after the assassination. Yeah. Uh, Candy Barr, Juanita Phillips. She dated Mickey Cohen for a time. That is uh, Let's see. There was Delilah. There was Diana the Huntress. Um, the, there was Jewel Brown, the African-American jazz singer who is now like historic and famous. And uh, she was mentioned in the previous episode with uh, author Danny Fingerroth. And she yes. was not, I, I want to uh, specify, she was not a dancer. She was a singer. And uh, I listened to an interesting interview with her today where she said uh, someone gave her a hundred dollar tip and Ruby came over and said, where's my half? And she goes, excuse me, Mr. Ruby. I'm not one of your dancers. And uh, she later, you know, became a, a legend in, in the jazz community. So, okay. Thank you for that boring aside, Joe. All right. Back to the dancers, folks. Uh... <laughs> singer or dancer. Yeah. Nobody cares about jazz singers. But... Okay. I mean, she's legendary, but. Well, whatever. Okay. Uh, Geneva Foster, uh, Jada, of course. Joy Dale, who was Joyce Lee McDonald. Um, Kathy Kay, Little Lynn, Marilyn Moon, Naja, Najada, uh, Nikki Joyce, Peggy Steele, Penny Dollar was a big one back in the day. And we'll, we'll touch on some of these uh, a little bit more. Robin Hood, Rose Sheremy for a time, Tammy True. Um, so there's a lot of these. A lot of these women are kind of interlaced with the Carousel Club and Jack Ruby and even other elements of the story. You know, when, he, when you think about Dallas being this this huge city now i mean it, it seems like back in 1963 joe everybody was kind of knew everybody yeah. you know i mean when you have people like they just come in and out of the story you know and and we'll we'll get into a lot of these stories because there's a lot of good ones and some uh definite tidbits that you haven't heard before that's for sure um but joe you want to start us off with the AVGA. Sure. So one of the things you might have been wondering is how did Jack Ruby get his girls? Uh, ooh, ooh. That's a girl on the right. I was talking to bottom right that you were uh, poo-pooing, Rob. Um, yeah, jazz singer. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, ooh. she's... I mean, she became like really famous. So, uh, yeah, true. Um, you know, you have uh, Jada on the bottom left. I believe that's Kathy Kay in the bottom middle. Uh, Diana Hunter and a few girls on the top. Yeah, and neat. yes, and this was um, another know. some. This is a Jada. Uh, Jada, and uh, so <laughs> Jada. most Jada, most high-end girls came from the American Guild of Variety Artists, the AGVA, Agva, yeah. Agva. and that was an entertainment union. Uh, the Carousel Club closed in nineteen sixty February nineteen sixty four, so it was actually open more than two months after Jack Ruby. Um, shot lee oswald on the 24th and uh because variety is the spice of life is that how that saying goes i was gonna ask it you. is good so the girls would travel from club to club around the state and country however jack ruby liked to use amateur girls who couldn't who were not hired by the agva rules and they would cost 10 to 15 dollars a night instead of a minimum of 35 
for the AGVA union dancer, like minimum wage. Well, I happen to have here, Joe. Sure. For the folks at home, an AVGA contract for the Carousel Club signed by Jack Ruby. And this is for the dancer uh, named Tony Turner. And this is from February of 1962. And just to give you all guys an example of what he would pay his girls. Now, this is a preformed contract, basically. And he wrote a lot of stuff into it. I don't know how legally binding that is, but I guess it is if she signed it. Um, but basically it says that the operator hereby warrants that he is the operator uh, herein at the present time and for the duration of this contract and engages the artist and the artist hereby accepts said engagement to present her act under the direction, supervision, and control of the operator as an exotic snake act of one person <laughs> at the Carousel Club in the city of Dallas for a period of two, two consecutive weeks, seven days a week, three times a day, yeah. starting on Monday, February 26, 1962, for which the operator agrees to pay the artist and the artist agrees to accept as full payment the sum of $175 weekly payable immediately preceding the first performance on the concluding night of each week's engagement hereunder. Artist hereby gives and grants to the operator the option of extending this agreement for two additional periods of two consecutive weeks each. Okay, so basically what that means is Jack Ruby paid her $175 a week for two weeks to do her show. And if it's successful, he, ha he has the option of renewing her for two more consecutive weeks. At that same rate? Or at, at the, the same th rate. Interesting. Until he decides to stop. Okay, so she doesn't really have a say in it. And this is what Jada would got, got upset about later on um, because she didn't read the fine print, apparently. Because he, he she wanted to go back to New Orleans, but he kept her under contract. He kept renewing her option, right? And she got pissed. Mm -hmm. And uh, she ended up, you know, almost uh, having him arrested and taking him to court over it. Well, they, uh, they did, actually. They went to uh, Bill Decker, took them to a judge. Yeah. Uh, and they settled it without like further uh drama and but i was reading about that today and uh and, and it's very interesting Jada is one of them yeah it's very interesting because she uh, has some very interesting movements during that weekend that we'll get into i promise yep. it says basically that the artist shall always have feature billing which means top billing um the above agreement shall consist of a number total of six weeks, including options. At the termination of the above contract, the operator shall have to do a new contract at $200 a week for four weeks with a four week option at $200 a week. So there's, you know, different things that they would agree to, but that was Tony Turner's exotic snake act i would have liked to have seen that exotic snake act joe i can I imagine would... where that snake went well you know what the one of the uh, arguments has started with uh uh jada was she kept lifting her g-string and at the carousel AKA like showing a little flash, you know, oh, yeah. and Ruby did not like that because he was competing with the Weinsteins, <laughs> right? Uh, he was worried about getting his liquor license taken away. Yeah. And, and after reading, uh, uh, Danny Fingeroth's book and reading a ton today and listening to all of his, uh, dancers and reading a ton of their testimonies, he was really 
like concerned with that. He wanted to be considered an upscale joint, but he had more than the carousel. He had the Vegas club. He had the colony. He, I think he had one more. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you have to name Tiny Dancer, so you you know, yeah. Instead of Little Lynn, <clears throat> you could be Tiny the Tiny D. So how Jack Ruby got around a lot of this and the contract you just showed, right? Was that for? Who was that for? Who was it for? Yeah, the contract. Tony. Oh yes, Tony. Tony. Turner. Okay, so I'm guessing she was a, a Tina's a, sister. Yeah, so she was a union, a union dancer, but they would have amateur nights where they would have girls come off the streets and pretend like they were amateurs. Right? It's not too different today, really. Uh, but right, really isn't. Uh, but he would I'm get sure around there was a lot of girls that he was just like, "Hey, you want to come dance in my club? I'll pay you a hundred dollars a night." Sure. Well, girls, yeah, it probably and didn't go over well with the union dancers. Yeah, but again, they were guaranteed their money and they were guaranteed feature billing, so mm -hmm. eh, they shouldn't have got and, too upset. And I have a graph from an HSCA Ruby call log, which shows his number of calls during the spring to November uh, nineteen sixty three. And we'll show you the uh, uh, the corroboration with the union, the issues, and then how it jumped right before the assassination. It's really interesting, but I think it's pretty safe to say Ruby was trying to get around a lot of these union rules, even though I think the union was pretty much mob run or influenced anyway. There's, I don't see a way it couldn't have been. You know, you talk about like the pensions union with Hoffa, that Colonel Rev, thank you. Right, like you have, you have to think this this union was mobbed up, right, Rob? I can't hear you. See, so you caught me off guard. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm sure somebody was getting some kickbacks from it, but you know, it's typical. I don't know how legit of an organization this was, but. You know what I'm saying? Or what it encompassed, or if it was nationwide, or if it was the Dallas thing, or, or what was going on with it. But Apparently it was nationwide, and uh, a lot of the girls would make complaints to the union, which would piss Ruby off. And I think that's why he tried to get around it in a lot of ways, with, with the amateur nights, and then the, uh, the carousel club. Uh, he or two out of his four clubs he restricted amateur nights and only let amateurs perform at two of them so he was like kind of separating them he was still uh competing with the weinsteins across the street who were much more successful than he was and he was really concerned about his image yeah and like in today's dollars you know i'm sure a good dancer like well I don't know how it is in, in Connecticut, Joe, but I don't know either. Here close to where I live, uh, I'm actually about 20 minutes from West Virginia. And uh, Virginia doesn't have like full nude bars. You know what I'm saying? But West Virginia mm -hmm. does. Right. And maybe that was the same thing. Many with moons ago, I might have partaken in some fun evenings across the border. Um, and it look, them girls easy, easily make the good ones could easily make three to five hundred a night. Now they might end up snorting two hundred of that a night, but yeah, it was, it's they make good money now, so yeah, I would, I would say then, they make thousands of the top end ones, but well, like uh, Tammy, Tammy True basically, um she wrote a book and, and she basically took the job um, and she said it afforded her because her, her, I guess I think her husband knocked her up and left her. So she was yeah. forced to move in with her mom and she was able to 
afford a house and uh you know her mom didn't have to work anymore and all this stuff so yeah i mean they were they were set up pretty good back then definitely and uh, um she was one of jack ruby's most uh longest serving dancers and she was we got to get to the parkland stuff because in addition to Ruby at Parkland, guess who else was there? Jada. Jada, who hit somebody trying to flee Dallas on the morning of the 22nd near the Texas Instruments, uh, like the calculator, I think, <laughs> uh, factory. And she went in and there was an F, and she called someone for help. And I guess they dropped the guy off at some other clinic then went to uh park well, here's the story joe here's the story so there's this is bearing. this is from the garrison investigation okay and it's from detective frank melock uh from st louis or no, Give it sorry. To me. information received by telephone from charles burns st louis missouri march 10 67. he said i was on the job working for texas instruments on the day of the assassination about 30 minutes before it happened, I was walking between two buildings about a half a block off Lemon, Lemon Avenue, which was on the motor. He said, I was crossing the street and I stepped out in the street and I was hit by this gal in a Cadillac. License number, Louisiana license number 941985. And her name was Jeanette Conforto. She was in Dallas on that day and she was employed by the Carousel Club uh, owner Jack Ruby. She made the statement to the company security people since they were on the accident job and they questioned her. She was in a hurry to get to New Orleans right away and she made the statement. They asked if they could get a hold of her on the job at the carousel club and she said no. The nightclub wouldn't be open that night. Yeah. Uh, that's for this the Friday that, night. Sounds if you want to look up, unusual. Up. Yep, right there. Yep. And uh, this uh, is credit to Tony Chrome from the Jacks for for motion. I want to give him credit for that. But uh, yeah, I just want to show you how close that accident was to the parade route and Lemon, uh, which you just mentioned. And then they booked it right there to apparently drop off Burns, right? And then to Parkland. Right. So as it turned uh, out, it wasn't open that night because of the assassination. And she had... This fellow that was with her, I can't remember his name. It wasn't on the accident report. But they carried me over to the clinic to be x-rayed, and it all happened while I was in the clinic. They were actually with me at the clinic when it happened. It came over the radio, and he told me a long line of stuff that turned out not to be true. I don't know. I just thought you people might get interested in some of this information. This information, I understand, was given to the FBI by the company security chief. What the hell is that noise? Someone called me. Oh, good Lord. Um, Sorry. Where were we? Was she with you at the clinic? Did she seem nervous or upset? She was almost hysterical. You think for the fact of hitting you? I don't know. She was cussing me for doing this. She went into a side building and used the telephone to call this guy, and he was there in about two minutes. He was somewhere close in another Cadillac. You don't know who this fellow was? I don't know, but the security chief does know uh, because he got his name and everything, but it was never entered on the accident report. My security chief was working for Texas Instruments, blah, 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 accident report. It all sounds fishy to me. I'm calling from St. Louis. I'm still working for Texas Instruments, but I'm up here on field service for McDonald Aircraft. My number is blah, blah, blah. If you'd like to talk to me, give me a call, Detective Frank Mellock. So... Apparently, Jada was in a hurry on 11 63 uh, to get the hell out of Dallas and go back to New Orleans. So continue the story. So I think now we get to Parkland. Yes, yeah, so she gets a ride to Parkland. Or I'm not sure. Hold on, let me check. Both her... She arrives at Parkland first, and then followed by uh, Little Lynn. And of course, we know by um, Seth Cantor's 
uh, testimony that um, Ruby was at Parkland. So allegedly. why was allegedly? Uh, yeah. So you do have documentation of two Ruby strippers, Jada arriving before the president arrived and little Lynn arriving after, and who knows when Jack Ruby arrived. And uh, this is in part of uh, little Lynn's Warren commission testimony and other corresponding documents. And it's really interesting because she's trying to leave on 11 22. She gets in an accident. She ends up at Parkland. She ends up staying to the 24th. She then, and I'll show you the documents of this shortly. She then drives back to new Orleans, literally within minutes of the time Ruby shoots Oswald. But then when hearing about it on the radio, decides to stop at a gas station, make some phone calls, and then turn around and go back to Texas on Sunday. So her movements make absolutely no sense to me. And especially considering their previous uh, argument with the contract She's trying to leave. She can't leave. Uh, her boyfriend is a, a mafioso sounding guy. And uh, and let me show you this. Because I... Big pimp and spending cheese. Exactly. Because you know it was an interesting day, Rob? Wednesday, the... 22nd or the 20th so that is when jada jada, jada never i'm gonna do that every time <laughs> this is a deep this is actually a commission document um it's a party mr frank t tortiello see i won't mess that one up boyfriend of jada Exotic dancer of the Cal Carousel Club. Uh, this is all uh, participants at a party. Jack Ruby, Joe F. Federioli, a nephew of Vito Gen Genovese, who was the mob boss of uh, Philly and New Jersey. Um, his wife, uh, Mrs. Ann Bryant, who resides in the same parking lots. Jada, and uh, hey, shout out to John Naylor, uh, because I don't know if this is your relative, but it was Naylor's understanding, this was the guy that was furnishing the information to the FBI, that Joe P. Fredis Fredrisky, I'm sorry, it's so hard to read, <laughs> and, his, and his wife left for Dallas Thursday, November 21st a day before the assassination for New Jersey or someplace in the East. So that is also the day that little Lynn claimed to the Warren commission that she quit the carousel club. And so I'm, I'm wondering how serious was this, dispute if they're partying together on the 20th and she has a chance to get out on the 22nd she doesn't really have to come back right the guy didn't declined burns declined medical assistance why go to parkland why not just keep going to new orleans why not go to new orleans on sunday she just didn't and i don't know why it's very interesting because apparently um, her, she had a kid who was in New Orleans that she wanted to get back to, so she says. Yeah, so this is what she said to the Warren Commission. Mrs. Powell, that's her real Jada, name. not Little Lynn. But yeah, go ahead. Oh, this is Jada? No, no. Jada had a kid in New Orleans she wanted to get back oh, to. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go to Little Lynn's right now, uh, Warren Commission testimony. Uh, 
she's getting questioned by Mr. Bert Griffin, who we, uh, our guest touched upon last episode. Wait a minute. I know I went to Tulsa. This is uh, little Lynn speaking. And I worked the last two weeks in March. I stayed in Tulsa in March and I worked two weeks in Kansas city, Kansas city, Rob, <laughs> and came back and stayed in Tulsa until June 2nd. And I came home. Then when did you come back and work for Jack? Wait, don't rush me. <laughs> that was last summer. How did I get up past the asset up way past the assassination? It was last summer. While I worked for Jack Ruby up until two days before the president was assassination assassinated. I closed on Tuesday. It happened on Thursday, didn't it? Mr. Griffin was like Friday. So is she playing stupid here? You have to think so. Yeah. I mean, who can't <laughs> remember? She says, I got mad and quit for some reason. I mean, you're going to remember a couple of months later why you got mad and quit your job. I mean, we were going to get there. I promised. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah. She got mad at him and quit and doesn't even remember why. And. And this is actually kind of like if you're pissed uh, enough to quit your job, you know why. I mean, come on. Right. So we'll get to uh, the testimony of well, Andrew on Armstrong. Second, wasn't, okay. wasn't little Lynn the one that j did Jack Ruby Western Union like right yes. before he went and shot Oswald in the basement? Yep. Fort Worth. So she quit already. I guess, maybe I guess he was paying her what he owed her left, maybe. Or she it's was possible. borrowing money. I, mean, I don't know. It's possible, but I think I viewed from what I was able to glean from reading a ton of uh, dancer interviews and the interviews of the manager that took over once Ruby went to jail that we'll get into, I promise. Uh, I looked at little Lynn as probably one of his most reliable long-term and l pretty much loyal um employees but whether that loyalty was out of love or fear that goes back to the bronx tale uh, <laughs> it, i i think it probably was out of fear because when you look at some of these hsca stuff and statements we're going to get into of uh the guy that the manager that quote unquote took over once Ruby went to jail, uh, he was still scared in the HSCA time and was keeping his mouth shut. And we'll show you how they literally had to, uh, you know, pluck your teeth to get what's the what's the saying? Uh, pull your teeth to get an answer out of you. Like he will show you how in two sentences he goes, "Oh no, I don't know about that." And they go, well, you told our investigator this. And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I could say that. Oh, yeah, that it's. Well, as you'll see, folks, and I see some of the comments, uh, people had a high opinion of Jack Ruby, and uh, some were lo very loyal to him. Um, but there was also some who said quite the opposite. And before we get a little too further, Joe, I wanted to touch on uh, some of the deaths of some of Jack Ruby's girls real quick. Sure. So we have Betty McDonald, Nancy Mooney in February of 64, uh, suicide by hanging in Dallas jail. Uh, Rose Sheremy, hit and run victim in September of 65. Um, Little Lynn, 1966, victim of a gunshot. Um, yeah. Delilah, uh, shot by her husband after one month of marriage in September of 66. Um, I'm just scanning them real quick. Maybe that's all we got of the dancers, but in that small span of, well, 1966 the first nine months okay you have judge joe brown who presided over the ruby trial dead of a heart attack 
Little Lynn, of course, we said uh, Ruby employee who was last talked with Ruby before the Oswald shooting. She died from a gunshot. Earlene Roberts, Oswald's landlady, has a heart attack. Al Bogard, car salesman, who said Oswald test drove a car, suicide. Captain Frank Martin, Joe. Dallas mm-hmm. Boys captain who witnessed the Oswald sling. That's the yeah. Ruby shooting Oswald. Told the Warren Commission... There's a lot to be said, but probably be better if I didn't say it. Yeah. Uh, cancer got him. Lee Bowers Jr., car accident. Um, and then Delilah was shot by her husband after one month of marriage. Uh, William Pitzer, who was a JFK autopsy photographer who described his duty as a horrifying experience. Suicide. Um, so, yeah, there's... Oh, and James Worrell saw a man flee the rear of the Texas School Book Depository, car wreck. So there's this, when does conspiracy or when does coincidence become a conspiracy? And the only reason I bring all this up is, of course, to tie in, ties in Joe with the, uh, from the Roscoe White episode, you know, of his, from, of his hit list. You know, he says he was out killing these people you know in the years after the assassination and you got to wonder um because i think jada when they're jada jada did she died in in a weird way but it wasn't until 1980. um she might have died in a motorcycle accident was it was her or little lynn one of the it wasn't little lynn uh, i think it might have been 44 for jada i think i read that yeah, it was in 1980. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, yeah, uh, it's not. I could. I think that's right, actually. Um, I know it's right. Tiny Dancer said the the real money is in yachting, and I was like, like below deck. Have you ever seen that show? <laughs> I have not. Oh, don't worry. It's uh. Probably, crazy. it's uh, it's a Bravo show about these people, these deck hands and these cooks that hook up below deck. Are you sure that's what it's called? If it's on the Bravo network, yeah, no, it's called Tiny Dancer. Back me up. It's below it's called deck. Below Deck. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Uncle Dave in the house. What's up, buddy? Yes. What's he saying? Frederico exported left Dallas on November yep. 22nd in the early morning hours. That's what I just, I think I just read that. I think I said the first 21st, but yes, he did leave before the assassination and uh, hitch it back up east. They weren't sure where. Don't forget about Larry Crayford too. Right. Dipping. Oh, I, I, ha- I have a beautiful statement here from little Lynn on Larry Crayford. Do you want to see it? <laughs> You'll love this one. All right, give me a second, gentlemen. Oh, he was a handsome. And man. here we go. Old LC. All right, come up now. Yep. And uh, shot. You you might be shocked by this. You might not be. But she described him as. A creep. (laughs) Mr. Griffin, do you remember the last fellow, Larry Crayford? (laughs) Isn't he kind of a carnival guy? (laughs) Yeah. That is the fellow. (laughs) Yes, I remember him. Do you remember anything about Jack's twist board? Interesting. (laughs) Yes, I demonstrated his twist board here in the building with the exhibits. And, the, and this is Little Lynn again. Uh, the Texas product show. Yes. How many times did you go out to demonstrate? Just once. How long were you there? 30 minutes to an hour. Jack called me, blah, blah, blah. He and another fellow. Oh, there was another boy he had picked up in addition to Larry Crayford by the name of Tommy, according to. Thomas Beckham. Hmm, maybe. He had another fellow 
at this time, I was demonstrating the twist board that this boy was living with him. His name was Tommy something, and he was staying with him the last time I was there, living in Jack's apartment. Yes, and you have to keep in mind that uh, uh, little Lynn was living in the same apartment complex as Jack Ruby because her old apartment complex was a little seedy and there was a lot of... Uh, uh, bad stuff going on so when this new uh apartment complex opened ruby invited uh little lynn to stay in that complex and that was that is that same complex to uh uncle dave's point that that party was hosted where uh frederico Federico or whatever his name was was there um the nephew of Vito Genovese. So at this time, blah, 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 living in Jack's apartment. Yes, they came out there and we went to the apartment and Jack cooked dinner for us all. How old a fellow was Tommy? About 25, I guess. What did he look like? Well, I think he looked, he, he told me he had played baseball. He looked like a baseball player. Baseball players all look alike, sort of athletic type but not muscle muscle bound. <laughs> I didn't know that before. Uh, there was a specific baseball type about how tall, 5'11", brown hair. I think he was from Iowa. Really nice kid. Had a job. Was he working? I don't know. How long had Tommy been living with Jack? I don't know. When did he move out? You got me. I don't know. <laughs> uh, and this is a common trend throughout all the testimony for a lot of Ruby's dancers and his employees. I don't know. I can't remember. I have to check on that. I've seen it all day. I've seen it all week. And uh, he goes to college at TCU and you can drop him off. So he's having a uh, little Lynn drop this boy off that was staying with him at TCU, the college there, uh, Texas Christian university. I believe. And this kid was working around there, blah, 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 blah. And then while she was driving him home, she asked him, how long have you known Jack? He, and he said, I don't know him. <laughs> I didn't have enough money to get to Fort Worth. And I started talking to him on the street. And he told me to come up to the club and he'd give me a couple of dollars to work. And then he got me a ride. I'll bet he did. So later in the testimony, it goes on to state how Ruby was being made fun of for picking people up on the street and was telling them to say he's a friend of his from Chicago's. Yeah. A little desperation. It's kind of like an Edward Edwin Walker situation, right? And the look and Dallas was freaky back in the day, man. That's all I can tell you. What's up, Colleen. Oh, hi, Colleen. Better late than never. You can catch it all in the replay as well. But welcome in. So, Joe, I think play a little bit of Jada, that interview you got. Yes. So people can get a little taste of Exotica. Okay. What's up, Sally? Welcome in. First time on the live. Hello, hello. Hello. Welcome, Sally. Now hopefully this will work. It worked yeah, let us know if you hear it. Got a, how long did you know Jack Ruby? I knew Jack Ruby for approximately four, five, six months. In what relationship? I was employed as the uh, teacher at the Carousel Club, and I had known Jack before I went to work there, and uh, I had a slight hassle with Jack, and I had left, and uh, that was the end of my association with Jack. What about politics? Does he seem interested in politics? Particularly regarding the Kennedys. I have heard Jack talk about the Kennedys, and I've been trying to think, and it's so confusing today, but I believe he disliked Bobby Kennedy. Get no recollection of what he had ever said about the president. Uh, yes, he followed that statement up about Bobby with something about uh, Jack Kennedy, but I can't for the minute just form it in my mind. Do you think? that uh, Jack Ruby is a type of man that 
was capable of killing the assassin of President Kennedy Why out of stop? love for Kennedy, Hang on. out of political motives. Let me uh, answer this. Very carefully. I don't think he loved Kennedy that much. Uh, I don't know why he would do it. I'd say he would be perfectly capable of an act like that. Uh, very much so. All right. So, I could not hear that, guys, because I was playing it through my computer. So, that's why we were doing that back and forth. What did you think? Was she pretty careful with her words or not? <laughs> I would say she was very methodical. I mean, given what happened, given the fact that, she, you know, she wanted this guy arrested, uh, charges brought on him, then they're partying together two days before the assassination, then this weird stuff happens on November 22nd with her trying to leave Dallas and this before Ruby shot Oswald. Um, just weird. But perpetual concepts, man. Thank you so much. You rock, sir. Oh, wow. Very am, thank you. However you identify, I'm guessing you're a dude. With and dude thank you, picture. Colleen. Yes, and Colleen as well, coming in strong with the super sticker. We appreciate it. Man, you guys are really, I feel I feel almost like a stripper getting tipped in the carousel club, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like oh, that. Let me show you some. Oh. Uh, uh, boom. Yeah, uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I oh. think Jack Taylor brings up a great point here. Very guarded. Uh, yeah, it's very suspect. Very. Yes. But should we should we talk about the uh, the bartender <laughs> real quick <laughs> of the Carousel Club, a guy by the name of Andrew Armstrong? Um, now this was a back in the time, you know, uh, wasn't very popular to have. You know, um, black people employed in these white establishments and in very high ranking positions. And it technically, he was the bartender. And I, was he sleeping there, Joe, as well? No, I don't think he slept there. I think he, I think it was just had, Crayford that was sleeping there. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I believe so. I think he had his own place. So he was working for Ruby for 18 months. So, Initially, and as we'll get there in a second, uh, he did testify to the Warren Commission. Uh, he ran the club after Ruby was arrested. And he, let's just say he likes to change his story. And you literally have to have a crowbar to kind of get it out of his mouth and get his mouth open because he is not, he does not, volunteer anything well yeah, I don't keep know. in mind you know the, the the black workers at the school book depository keep in mind th these guys didn't want to say anything or be associated with any of this white people business <laughs> treating each other you know what i mean so <laughs> yeah leave me the f out of it like <laughs> yeah, keep this in mind here yeah okay and we're gonna do a Joe little... will be Burt Griffin, and, <laughs> and I will be Andrew Armstrong Jr. for this okay. little spicy monologue. Yes. So, so please, okay. Joe, so let's give him an example of of Andrew Armstrong's Warren Commission testimony. Sure, and we're just going to read this. We're not going to put it up, <laughs> but uh, I mean, you, you could just go to Mary Farrell and type in Jada and it will be the first thing that comes up in documents. Uh, but Andrew Armstrong Jr. Uh, was a Ruby manager. I should have put that in quotation marks because he kind of self. <laughs> well, he basically uh, was the manager when he when was. Ruby yeah. Was. He ran it after, after Ruby went to jail for and when Ruby wasn't months. there a lot, he ran it, you know, he was in charge. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and if, and okay, so we'll, we'll get, we'll get to it. So I'm going to start. All right. <clears throat> <clears throat> so the Warren commission. So Mr. Armstrong, the Warren commission in 
indicated that you met him in the spring of Ruby in the spring of 1962 when you first went into the carousel for a job. Was that the first time you met Jack Ruby or had there been a previous contact in the late 1950s? Ha. Uh, well, yes. Uh, I used to go over to uh, with a group that uh, uh, we came out of uh, West Dallas, you see, and we used to go over there and sing. We used to take them over there and they would sing and make money by people pitching pennies and quarters to them, you know? They would catch them in the cuffs of their pants. Would you sing near the club or in the club? In the club. In the Vegas club. You sing it just like that? And that was when Jack Ruby ran the Vegas club? That was when Ruby ran the Vegas club. Yep, yep. Okay, we're, we're skipping on a little bit because this testimony is really long. So this is moving on to Ruby uh, his, after he was in jail. Well, uh, uh, so what were your responsibilities uh, when Ruby went to jail? Well, my responsibilities grew and grew and putting down the receipts in the books. I'd be going to the bank, uh, things like that, making sure there was enough girls, you know what I'm saying? Uh, there was enough waitresses, you know what I'm saying? Uh, going and putting ads in the paper. They just grew. Then it was just like, you know, being manager of a club, you know, like that. P.I.M.P. So they grew until the time of the assassination, and then you were actually in charge after the assassination for a while? Sure, sure. There wasn't anybody but me in charge after the assassination, fool. Interesting. Yeah. Did you know uh, Joyce McDonald? Bart Griffin? <laughs> Uh, sir, please. Did you know Miss Joyce McDonald? Joyce McDonald? I don't know. I can't say. There was three or four thousand girls that went through that place when I worked there. The little time I did, and I probably couldn't call it all these names. Do you remember Jada? Oh, yeah. I remember Jada, all right. How can you forget Jada? Mm -mm -mm. Do you know how Jack went about hiring her? Well, all I remember is Jack got a contact out in New Orleans, and uh, he probably being in the business he was in, he knew that she was one of the top billed girls, you know. And at the time, he needed him a top billed girl because the Colony Club was kicking his ass. <laughs> So now we're jumping to Ruby's dogs. Uh, where was Sheba after Walt Oswald was shot, Mr. Armstrong? Now, 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 that's another thing that I don't... Uh, I, where was Sheba after Oswald was shot? Uh, uh, now, I'm Sir? told that Sheba was in the car. Now, I remember going and getting Sheba. I don't remember whether I went to the police station and got Sheba or whether I went to the carousel club and got Sheba, but I remember going to get Sheba, you know, now, now I could have went into the police station, but if I did, I would have had to get somebody to carry me. <laughs> and I don't remember getting anybody to carry me to pick up Sheba. Cause I didn't have a car, but you ended up with Sheba, the dog. Yeah, yeah, I ain't up with Sheba. She mine now. <laughs> That's right. All right, so uh, Mr. Armstrong, you have said in one of your interviews with one of our staff members that Jack Ruby did indeed gamble. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Did he ever play dice or cards or whatever for money? No, no. I mean, well, Jack and his roommate... <laughs> What's his name? Uh, they might have had a few poker games or something, if you know what I'm talking about, but nothing big. That's not gambling, though. That's just passing the time away. You know what I'm saying? Fair enough. Do you know of uh, your personal knowledge whether or not Jack Ruby ever had a card game for money in his apartment? I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. if they Do did, you think they he did? Like me. Do you think he did? Well, I imagine he did. I mean, I it'd be safe to say that. Yeah, they had a few poker games sometimes, I guess. Sure. 
So who would have, have attended? Which of Jack's friends? Probably just the guys in the apartment there. They would lay around the swimming pool together. <laughs> if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait. All right, all right, all right. Yeah. So that one better than our last uh, skit. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you did Thank a you. great job. You did I a great hear job. Hear the applause. You did a great job, and uh, <laughs> that, you know, he goes. He, uh, Griffin asks him if Jack Ruby ever gambled. It's a pretty simple question. He goes, "No." But he goes, "But you told us he did." And he goes, "Oh, well, yeah." He he might have he might have he probably actually yeah I could pretty much say yeah 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 he did like it's just it's just contradictory fucking muddying of waters everywhere it's crazy and uh, it's crazy how fifteen years later I mean they were very guarded still this guy you know in the late seventies holy and wow. Sally. We got British money, Joe. We got some wow. pounds in. Pounds. Where are we going? Got me the scene for a month. I've been off work. London. Man, thank you, Sally. Thank you so much, Sally. Across the pond. Yes. Say hello to Appreciate Bart. you. See him walking the streets of London. Who? Bart. Oh, Bart. I was going to be like, <laughs> uh, stay away from Jack the Ripper. Yes, thank you so much, Sally. We greatly appreciate it. Greatly appreciate it. Yes. So this is something interesting, and it gets back to uh, what we were talking about with Ruby's phone calls and the union, which is right here, right? And this kind of has a correlating bump as to his phone calls, his toll calls, which are, I believe, out-of-town calls. And look how this just goes from about 30 to 120. So it pretty much quadruples in 19, in the fall of 1963. And it's really interesting, just as a, f a former financial analyst, looking at this, this bump right here. Right? It's, I don't know. And then this biggest Jada's buttocks, right? And I think he got uh, Jada around close to that time before he started having problems with the union. So it's really interesting. This whole uh, like like Rob said, he found fifty four or fifty five six on one list, and here Armstrong is saying there were three or four thousand that came by and. The 18 months he was working there in the spring of 1962 and you have to think a lot of those were those like kind of one-time amateurs maybe that were whatever doing a lot of side work to make their bills and actually that that is a pretty good segue to what i am going to show next rob which Strip is it out, joe show it it's you know how it is little lynn and what did she say what and, did she say? Well, da, da, da. I'm going to start from a couple seconds in. If you tell me back a couple seconds, I won't be able to hear it. Just tell me back, okay? Okay. I don't, I don't think we got any sound here, Joe. It's going to come on. Your last performance in public. Okay. Yes, it will. What's the reason for that? I, I don't like the strip business. Mm -hmm. And uh, so why are you appearing here for these? Because of financial difficulty, uh, because of being evicted so many times and so many jobs my husband's lost. You've had a lot of trouble with uh, landladies and landlords lately, we understand. What sort of trouble do you have? 
Well, as soon as they find out who I am and who I was connected with, they always ask us to leave for some odd little reason. What sort of excuses do they give for asking you to leave? Well, they say that they don't want to be involved in the Jack Ruby in any way, nor do they want any trouble, and they don't want the investigators coming around. Have you been bothered with investigators at all since the Jack Ruby trial? Quite a bit. What sort of questions have they been asking you, and where are the investigators from? Uh, the investigators are from Dallas and Fort Worth, also the Warren Commission. And uh, the questions are, I guess, just about the same as the, they ask anyone. Is, Did you know Jack Ruby? And so on and so forth. What kind of a man was Jack Ruby, or is Jack Ruby? Well, I, I believe he was, he was a nice employer to me. Uh, I believe he's a uh, hired... man sucks. I don't really like that's to give my own opinion of what I really believe. All right, that's it, too. <laughs> I got to give a shout-out. Well, first of all, thank you again to uh, Scott again and Jack again. Boom. And, and my friend Vinny. Boom. My friend Vinny in the chat tonight. There is levels to this, Vinny. Yeah. He says my levels are high. That's what he says when I'm like too excited. It's probably because he thought there might be some audio issues there at the beginning of that footage. I didn't know if it was going to kick in or not. It no, he just called in. He just calls my levels high all the time because I'm always excited and you'd never off, know, Joe. Off the charts. He asked me to rate it one to ten, and I'm like, mm. two. No, like usually eight ish, but uh, <laughs> but it, it's funny, and uh, yeah. So that that was um, little well, Lynn. That segues perfectly into what I got here. I got it. Well, what do you think about it? Because I couldn't hear it, and I listened to it earlier. But well, it's just she's also guarded. You know, she's having problems being. Being Little Lynn, being the dancer, being tied to Jack Ruby, being tied to the assassination, being questioned evicted. by federal agents, you know, and, and getting evicted and blah, blah, blah. But, uh, you know, sob story for her, or whatever. But I happen to have an affidavit from Roger Warner, who was a special agent of the United States Secret Service. And says, I'm employed as a special agent for the United States Secret Service in Dallas. I was employed in the position on November 24, 63. The following is a statement regarding my interview with Karen, Karen Lynn Bennett Carlin, also known as Little Lynn, on November the 24th, and is true and correct to the best of my knowledge. Now, November 24th, if you'll remember, folks, is the day that Jack Ruby shot Lee Oswald. So this is a relatively quick interview done by the Secret Service. And listen to how weird this is, Joe. Mm -hmm. So on November 24th, at the request of Inspector Thomas Kelly of the U.S. Secret Service, I met with Carolyn, or shit, Karen Lynn Bennett Carlin of Fort Worth, Texas. The time was 11 p.m. Also present at the interview was Bruce Ray Carlin, who was identified by Mrs. Carlin as her husband. Mrs. Carlin related to me facts regarding a $25 money order sent to her by Jack Ruby earlier in the day. She also related to me the fact that she had learned that Mr. Who is that? Mr. Duar? Duar? Once employed by Jack Ruby had seen Lee Harvey Oswald in Ruby's nightclub, the carousel. Mrs. Carlin stated that she had also vaguely remembered Oswald being at the club, but was by no means sure of the fact, nor of the fact that she had ever seen Oswald. So she might have seen him, but she wasn't sure. She might not have. She might have. Who knows? That's that's the trend in in, in Armstrong's <laughs> testimony in, in in Zada's in Little Lynn's. It's all maybe oh no maybe not. Yeah. It's just like all back and forth. Like what the fuck can you make out of it? Easy, easy there. Come on. Bomb. At the beginning <laughs> of the above interview, Mrs. Carlin was highly agitated and was reluctant to make any statement to me. She stated to me that she was under the impression that Lee Harvey Oswald, Jack Ruby, and other individuals unknown to her 
were involved in a plot to assassinate President Kennedy and that she would be killed if she gave any information to the authorities. It was only through the aid of her husband that she would give me information at all. She twisted in her chair, stammered in her speech, and cried on the, to the point of hysteria. Okay. Later, toward the end of the interview, which lasted about 45 minutes, Mrs. Carlin became much calmer. She stated that she had no memory of Oswald whatsoever until she had heard Mr. D I don't know who this guy's name is, Mr. Dewar statement on television. Also, that she had no information in her possession, which indicated that Ruby was involved in a plot to assassinate President Kennedy. She did not think all information she had related be kept confidential and prevent retaliation against her in case there was a plot afoot. She stated she did not wish to give or to get involved in the matter at hand. So, yeah. This, uh, that's a weird same day interview. Very weird. Yeah. Same Good. day is, is really weird. Cause you take those statements, uh, much more seriously than you do ones for say HSCA 15 years later. Right. Yeah. Day of. And then we go to Jada. Some more from Jada folks. So Jada from new Orleans, and this is from a newspaper clipping from the, I guess it's the Dallas Morning News. Jada uh, from New Orleans, a redheaded stripper who was going great in Jack Ruby's Carousel Club until shortly before the boss blasted the midriff of presidential assassin Lee Oswald, flew into New York yesterday, a refugee from Dallas. It isn't that Jada, Jeanette Conforti, once in the Copa Chorus line, believes that Ruby is about to be let out suddenly from the Dallas Hooskow. It's just the thought of what might happen if he did get out. In view of some of the things she said about him since last Sunday, that makes Jada mighty uncomfortable. That and the tenseness of Dallas. Do I know Jack Ruby? You bet I do, she told the news yesterday. I went there two months ago on a two-week contract to star in the in this club, only I found he had a fine print clause giving him the option to keep on renewing every two weeks, and I couldn't get away. Though I have a club of my own I wanted to get back to in New Orleans. So I got to know Ruby real well. Too well. So, very interesting comments from Jada. That I guess this is a week after the assassination. Very interesting. And if you notice, I have uh, some nice pics of uh, oh, yeah. Jada up there now. Yeah. Once, Jada said, he opened my dressing room and pushed a drunk man in. Then he followed in and beat the man mercilessly. He <laughs> strutted out like a peacock to brag about what he'd done to a man who was annoying his star. If he fought somebody, he was always sure he had the advantage the party would be drunk, much smaller than him or a girl. He always boasted that he had nothing to worry about, claiming he had big shot friends on the police force or in the DA's office. He was always inviting cops in to drink and eat and see the show. No doubt it was his familiarity, familiarity that got him into that police building where he shot Oswald. Um... Jada hadn't been around Ruby to speak of for nine days before he murdered Oswald, which contradicts with your, uh, your re FBI report about partying with him two days before the assassination. Mm -hmm. um, he became angry with her one night because she rebuffed his advances, she says, and turned off the lights and ordered him off stage. He threatened to burn my clothing and maim me, she declared. I was afraid of him. And the next day, I got the sheriff's office to put him under a peace bond. He owed her $700 in salary at the time, she says, and her union, the American Guild of Variety Artists, took Ruby to court. And a judge ordered him, after a tempestuous scene, to pay up. Two fifty. That was two nights before the Kennedy assassination. 
So the same day they partied together that night, earlier in the day, he lost a court case where he owed her $700. Losing to me, said Jada, hurt his prestige, which always needed building up because he wasn't smart enough to own those two clubs for himself. Other people put up the money. He was interested in only one thing, and that's building up Jack Ruby. He even managed to be at the hospital before Mr. Kennedy died, she said. That fits in with his idea that he should be around big events and prominent people. He expressed great bitterness at Oswald, I was told. He said the good image of Dallas was destroyed, and he went back to the club and told his employees that he hoped somebody would redeem the prestige of Dallas. By Sunday morning, the stocky ex-Chicagoan had decided that he would act, and he did, doubly blackening the name of his adopted city. So, <laughs> yeah, there's more from Jada. Yeah. And then we have this little ditty, Joe. Okay. So, this is from Mrs. William... Hitty. Hit the hell is that? Hitty. Fitty. Oh. Hitty. Mrs. William Hitty Fitty. Okay, I don't know. Um, Mrs. Sue? <laughs> Mrs. William J. Hitty. Okay. Hitty. At noon on May 10th, 1967, I called for a cab from St. Paul Hospital, and within minutes, uh, it arrived from the exchange Mark cab stand nearby. During the ride to my home, I asked the driver who he had been driving cabs in Dallas for 16 years if he had known William Wally. He answered that he had, that Wally had been one of his best friends for years. Okay, now this is the guy that supposedly took Oswald fr from... The Greyhound station to his rooming house in Oak Cliff. William Wally, the cab driver. Mm -hmm. who yeah, a few blocks didn't down. Didn't live past 1965 either. Uh, so he thought about Wally's death and replied, or he answered that he had and that Wally had been one of his best friends for years. Then asked what he and other cab drivers thought about Wally's death. He replied, oh, they killed him. You know, a whole bunch of people here have been killed. And he went on to comment on that subject as as well as the details of Wally's accident. He stated that he, as well as other cab drivers here, know for a fact that Tippett had worked for Ruby as a bouncer in one of the clubs. And it seems to me, he said he himself had driven Tippett to work there several times, as had other drivers. He also added that Oswald had worked for Ruby for a while. He remarked that he had known Ruby, what a character he was, using the words real weirdo <laughs> with his stack of $1 bills topped by a 10 or 20. Uh, he said, too, that Ruby kept an apartment just off of the North Central Expressway for his girls with some sorry unflattering remarks about those girls and he had driven Ruby and those girls to and from that apartment many many times he also indicated that the relationship between Ruby and the girls was qu not quite a normal one you know why Joe because he used to eat him himself <laughs> <laughs> very good you are learning sir uh, he told me, too, that some reporter, uh, not from Dallas, had rented Oswald's now unrentable room for a week just to go over it carefully, inch by inch. In doing so, he found Jack Ruby's telephone number written underneath a corner of torn wallpaper in Oswald's rooming house. I regret that I did not get either the man's name or cab number. It is a 15 to 20 minute drive from the hospital to my home. And this discussion lasted for most of that time. We sat in front of the house a few minutes more to continue talking. But how's that for something weird? I saw that document. I'm like, wow, there's a lot there to unpack. 
So Jack wallpaper under a piece of torn wallpaper in the roomy house. Have you ever seen that? And never seen of, or heard that before. Part, part of the list, like of inventory items. Never. There yeah, I. So, here is a part of a garrison interview with somebody, and I don't know who it is. Um, just this, just that. Um, it starts with F, their last name. Uh, and this is wild. Okay, so F says yeah, and then Boxley, Bill Boxley. Oh uh, He moved into an apartment next to a Ruby stripper named Robin Hood. Ruby had two or three strippers in this apartment house at 4015 Simpson. Larry Smith moved in to the middle of them, and they set up operations at the Charm Club. Well, anyhow, Father McCann was in that area with the Cuban meetings. They've since torn the house down. T, what a scenario we've got here. Father McCann and Robin Hood. Boxley says, it gets wild. F says, what about a guy named Charles Crop? Garrison says, that sure sounds familiar. Boxley, yeah, I've heard that. Well, you should have heard it. He's a Chicagoan who ties together Shaw and Ferry. Oh, he called us about a year ago. Is that where you got that from a short memo? Yeah. I recently came across it reviewing the files, and he said that I think before the assassination, he had been working with some Cubans in an anti-Castro operation, fundraising or something, and they indicated in New Orleans that Shaw and Ferry were connected with him. We wanted to get more information from him, but he said that he was afraid to give it to us, uh, and he backed out of it, and that's the, uh, well, I think I can get a guy to move him because he made a tape of a conversation at the request of the FBI and sent the FBI a copy of it. This was before the assassination, and he didn't think about this again until you reopened your investigation. He still got the tape. Well, that would be great if, uh, well, we're not screwing anything up. Um, well, you know, I didn't know what you had done with it and didn't want to. He got scared to death, and we usually put them on the side and hope that they will relax a little. And uh, T says, all right, I've got a guy in Chicago that might be able to do him. To do him. To do him. Wow. Um, now, we've all heard about Father McCann before. Um, you know, uh, with the Odeo sisters, uh, he was in the Cuban community big time. So now he's also hanging around, uh, Jack Ruby strippers as well. And we'll get, I think we will get back. Well, I, th I thought I had something else on Robin Hood. What, Rob, we might have to do a part two of this because it goes so deep. Now, hold on. Okay. Well, you know, we were just dovetailing on the last episode. Right. Uh, of course. So Nancy Powell, Tammy True, right? This might be where you could put up some of my pictures I sent you there, Chief. Nancy Powell. <laughs> uh, this is from November 25th, 63, an interview with her by the FBI. Um. Miss Powell first became acquainted with Jack Ruby five years ago when he was operating the Vegas Club in Dallas. Miss Powell often went to the Vegas Club as a customer. Since she has been dancing at the Carousel Club, she has become well acquainted with Jack Ruby, who is the owner of the operator of the Carousel Club, and considers him a close personal friend. Miss Powell has never dated Jack Ruby and has never known Ruby to date girls from the show at the Carousel. However, Ruby does date girls regularly some of whom appear in other clubs in Dallas. Miss Powell said that Ruby was, quote, definitely not a homo, unquote. <laughs> Ruby's general relationships with his employees was good. However, Ruby had the type of temperament that would cause him to lose his temper and yell at his employees. But after he had gotten the grievance off his chest, he would forget about it. Powell said she last saw Jack Ruby on the evening of November 19th and has not seen him or talked to him since that time. She quit her job at the carousel on November 19th because of the difficulty she had commuting between Fort Worth and Dallas. Um, 
She felt that the club was solvent financially and that Jack Ruby had no financial difficulties. Ruby has what she believes is a 50% interest in the club, and the other half is owned by Ralph Paul, who operates the bullpen uh, in Arlington, Texas, and lives on a rural route in Arlington. Um, And she talks a little bit about uh, Jada. She says, this incident involved a dancer by the name of Jada, who is from New Orleans and has been dancing at the club for two or three months. Ruby cautioned Jada concerning some obscenity in her act and had instructed her to clean it up. One yes. night, Ruby was forced to turn off the lights on, on Jada's act when he felt that she was way out of line. For removing her G-string. <laughs> An argument ensued after this incident, and Ruby refused to pay Jada. And according to Jada, threatened to throw her down the stairs. And Jada allegedly swore out a complaint against Jack Ruby and went before the judge and all that jazz. Da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't get why she turned around when hearing the news and went back to Dallas. Yeah, I don't know. It's very strange, I have to say. Very. All right, next up we have uh, Najada, an interview with Najada. Not Jada, but Najada. <laughs> Mrs. Paul Colgrove was interviewed. Um, she is also known as Beatrice Colgrove and has the theatrical stage name of Najada. She stated she is presently residing in Pasadena, Texas. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, she had an argument with Ruby at the bar of the carousel on New Year's Eve 61 about the confused manner in which Ruby carried on his entertainment business. He slapped her in the face, and she then spoke to a lieutenant or captain of the Dallas Vice Squad who was in the club at the time, stating that she wanted to press charges against Ruby. In the presence of Ruby, the officer laughed at her and told her she was crazy. She then took her problem to Jack Cole American Guild of Variety Artists, Representatives, and Booking Agent, who said the problem was not in his jurisdiction. From time to time, she noticed numerous police officers enter the Carousel Club and go into Ruby's office, after which they would be observed leaving the club with bottles of whiskey under their arms. She recalled that one dancer, Kathy Kay, a white female, about 23, blonde-headed from England, was given a car by Ruby, and he went with her uh, for a period of time. She stated Kay could be traced by Jack Cole of AGVA uh, for contact. And according to Najada, Ruby had a mistress on the side who was not employed at the club, but who came and went at will and frequented the club. She was described as a white female with light brown hair, cut long in a ponytail, about five foot five, 115 pounds, late twenties, reportedly a secretary in Dallas, Texas, that Ruby claimed he had been keeping for some five to six years. Ruby failed to ever disclose this woman's identity. Interesting. Wow. Wonder if interesting. She, wonder if she worked at like the Dallas Morning News or something where he would put in ads or or the school book depository. Uh, yeah, or <laughs> yeah, I mean who knows? There there wasn't a shortage of women on the other floors of the TSBD. Oh, yes, here's here's the other interesting uh, Robin Hood. Okay, okay. Shirley Ann Malden was her real name, also known as Miss Robin S. Hood. <laughs> was interviewed at the Douglas County Jail, Joe, at Omaha, Nebraska. Omaha. Is this my surprise? Yes. Okay. She worked for Jack Ruby as a dancer for one week at the Carousel Club (laughs) shortly after this club opened in 1962. She had known Ruby since she was a small girl in Dallas, but had very little personal contact with him except for the period that she worked for him. About two and a half months ago, believed by her to have been on the night of her release from the Dallas city jail, where she was held on a drunk and disorderly charge for two days. She dated a Dallas attorney 
whom she only knew by the first name of Carol. Ringing any bells, Joseph? Ringing any bells down there in the comment section? Hmm? 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 Carol Jarnigan. That's what I was going to say, but wasn't wasn't that one of the TSBD workers? No, he was a, he was a lawyer. Okay. He stated that he observed Ruby and Oswald together in the Carousel Club. Right. Okay. And he was scared to death. Remember Barry Ernest in his book, The Girl on the Stairs, went to talk to him, and he was scared to death. And smoking chain smoking cigarettes in this little office. Um Yeah. Now what is uh what is exactly one of the guys Colleen? That was the episode. Caroling through the night. What a previous what episode. Yeah. A previous episode you did. Yeah, okay. So here we have corroborated by a dancer, former dancer, no known Jack Ruby since she was a little kid. Okay. Um, she dated a Dallas attorney whom she only knew by the first name of Carol. On this night, she and Carol visited a few Dallas nightclubs, including the Carousel, and were accompanied by no one. They stayed at the Carousel Club for about a 45-minute period, during which Ruby came to their table, greeted her, and she introduced Ruby to Carol. She stated this visit by Ruby was brief, and she described it as an apparent attempt by Ruby to get her to work for him again. So this is where Carol Jarnigan could have possibly met Jack Ruby and then overheard this conversation at the other table between Jack Ruby and whoever he was talking to, Larry Crayford or whatever, Lee Oswald, whatever. Leon. Okay. Malden stated that Lee Harvey Oswald was not known to her and she had never heard of his, of his, this individual prior to his arrest by Dallas police in connection with the shooting of president Kennedy on the night of her date with Carol. She, uh, overheard no conversation in the carousel club between Ruby and anyone. And she could recall no discussion regarding the shooting of the governor of Texas, which is what Carol Jarnigan was saying. Um, Malden did not believe Ruby served as a master of ceremonies at the Carousel Club on the night of her visit there with Carol, and she could not recall him making any introduction to the audience of anyone. She was definite in her recollection that uh, she and Carol did not engage in any conversation regarding uh, the reporting of anything they had overheard to the proper authorities. Malden stated that she that had she had any information such as overhearing a conversation between Ruby and Oswald in which they discussed the shooting of the governor of Texas, she would not have hesitated to report this information to the proper authorities. And this is uh, from the FBI interview of December 9th, 1963. Hmm. So who do we believe there? Oh, Robin Hood, who's known Jack Ruby since she was a little girl. Or I don't, Carol Jarnigan. I don't trust lawyers. <laughs> come on now. Come, <laughs> come, come now. And then the last thing I got here uh, is a FBI document from the director from the director of the FBI, that will be J. Edgar Huba, to the special agent in charge of Dallas. Re-Rep Special Agent Stuart Cameron dated 12-3-63 at Albuquerque. Re-Rep contains interview of a Mrs. Leona Karolinko, Albuquerque, former stripper at Subject's Carousel Club, who describes Subject as a homosexual who recruited teenage boys for homosexual activities. In the event not already done, Mrs. Kirilenko should be thoroughly interviewed and information in her possession concerning homosexual act motivation or homosexual activities of the subject should be pinned down. Mrs. Kirilenko should be asked dates, times, places, associates, and identities of individuals engaged in alleged homosexual activities with Jack Ruby 
Information furnished by Mrs. Kirilenko should be resolved. So, see, what, what always gets me, Joe, mm -hmm. is you have, you know, these women saying that, oh, Jack Ruby was definitely not a homosexual. He was a nice guy, blah, blah, blah. Very protective of his girls, blah, blah, blah. But then on the other hand, you have people that said that he was definitely a homosexual, definitely into weird stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, remember when he was he took the girl back to his apartment to interview her to try to get her to dance for him, and he, he just wanted to hump her leg, to grind on her leg, and she wouldn't let him? Like, just weird stuff. And there's ac accusations of bestiality between Jack Ruby and his, uh, his dog. I mean, just weird, 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 weird mm. stuff, okay? Fair so I, I just don't know where to fall on it. I mean, who do you, who do we believe? Or was he showing different versions of himself to different people, which is a little more believable? You know? <clears throat> like, you know, like you know me like this, right? But maybe one of my other friends in real life sees me as a weirdo or a homosexual you know, or whatever, you know what I'm saying? So I don't know if it's just, you know, people see a different side of Jack Ruby or if he's multiple or if he's a bi, it goes both ways. And back then they just called it homosexual. Who knows? Yeah. And not that it matters, but it's just a lot of odd behavior. You know, especially when, you know, he would find out he's, he's keeping another apartment where he puts his girls up. I'm sure he is getting girls for Dallas cops, um, getting them to do things for these cops and, yep. and other important people in Dallas. Wouldn't put it past him one bit. Um, no, they had an up there, upstairs section where they would... Uh you know i guess do the lap dances of the 60s up there and uh uh a lot of the top strippers the dancers we've talked about uh well, denied that that, that, uh, that one picture i sent you of that book that says jack ruby's girls on the back i put that up when you were talking earlier yeah i know but put it up now again okay. again okay and again, and again, because I want to point something out here. So, of course, after the assassination, a lot of people were trying to cash in on things, right? So there's a very obscure book out there. Uh, not many copies were made. I've looked it up on the internet. The cheapest one I could find is like 150 bucks. It's called Jack Ruby's Girls. If Joe could ever pull it up here. Yeah, I'm getting you know, one sec. It was uh, written by Diana Hunter, who was Diana the Huntress, uh, one of his strippers, and another one, I can't remember her name or off the top of my head. All right, it's coming up now. Come on, give me a break here. Yeah. Jeopardy theme song. Give me a break here, come on. Blow it up, Joe. Dirty. Okay. It's a funny book about the sad and tawdry milieu of man and a place where dirty ankle sex was the basic product. It tells about the girls who worked at Ruby's Carousel Club, how they uh, bilked customers and were frequently counterbilked. It's not an erotic book, but a bawdy one. Jack Ruby was a jangling mosaic of eccentric, eccentric, oh shit. Jack Ruby was a jangling mosaic of eccentricities. And while we probably will never know why he did what he did, the book helps explain the things that made him what he was. And it is definitely a 1970s book through and through. But pop up that quote again. And I don't know if you showed that from before. Which one? The quote that I sent you, the other picture, not that, that one. No, not her. Not the jazz singer. I know. That quote. This was, their book was dedicated in loving memory of Jack Ruby, 
our raging boss, our faithful friend, the kindest hearted son of a bitch we ever knew. I think that's an amazing summary, actually. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Uh, I, I think I think he was loyal to his girls. I think he was kind hearted. I think he was the son of a bitch, and uh, but he had his rage, which I can definitely understand. And uh, he was, as we discussed in our last episode with uh, the author who had wrote the book. A biography on Jack Ruby. He was very concerned about his image. <clears throat> concerned about his image uh, compared to the Weinstein's right across the street. Uh, he was very aware of this. This is what uh, got him into the, the fight with uh, Jada was that she was uh, pulling her g string and he had to turn the lights off. So it's yep. uh, a very interesting and fascinating multitude of stories and we might maybe do a part two after this if uh if people like it enough we haven't we can go deep on some strippers bro i think we just did joe well we can go deeper <laughs> but anyway <laughs> that's what she said Tiny dancer. all uh, right uh, i'm being silly folks, that's it for this week we hope you enjoyed the show thanks for hanging out with us Thank you so much, guys, for all the super chats, super stickers sent our way. Man, yes, killed it tonight. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. It's always fun hanging out with everybody and doing a show, and we hope you enjoyed this one. So until next time, folks. Pa 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 Panties. G-strings. Pulling. <laughs>